Okay, so first of all, I want to thank the organizers for letting me talk, and I uh, want to apologize because it's something I've been working on for a while, so probably some of you have seen bits and pieces of this, and so don't fall asleep during the parts you've seen. Uh, I want to say that this is work that's being done jointly with Michael Landis, a student with John Holsenbeck, and uh, yeah, so a lot of this is joint work. So first, just to set the stage, uh, quantitative traits, and by that I mean traits that vary continuously in populations. Obvious things are like body mass, height, and of course the famous bristle number of Drosophila. Um, these can be important in adaptation, for example, tolerance to low oxygen, tolerance being the trait. Um, obviously in disease, for example, obesity is a sort of uh, discretization of a quantitative trait of body mass, or BMI maybe, and um, obviously in agriculture, Things like fruit yield and seed yield are really important things that people are interested in optimizing when they're developing agriculture or interested in understanding in the wild, uh, wild progenitors of agricultural things. All right, so all of this is going to be sort of in the context of the model proposed by Fisher way back in the day when the biometricians and the Mendelians didn't know that they were talking about the same thing. And the idea here is that you have n by allelic loci. Um, does this guy work as a pointer? Oh. <laughs> oh, there it goes. Okay, great. Um, right, so you have n by allelic loci impacting the trait, and in this simple additive model, we just say that allele j at locus i has some some effect on the trait, and then your phenotype is just you sum up over all the loci and all the alleles at every locus. You know, you just take the effect of the allele that you have at that locus. And so what happens is as you increase the number of uh, loci involved, you go from sort of, you know, if you have one locus, you have three genotypes, so you get this very uh, patchy phenotype distribution. As you increase the number of loci to five, you get something that's starting to look pretty normally distributed. And when you get up to 100 loci, you end up getting something normally distributed. And of course, this is sort of a random model, but you can calculate things like the expected, the mean of the mean which has this form, and the mean of the variance in the population, which has this form. Um, but it's important to emphasize that right, these are expectations of means and expectations of variances. And um, basically, for the rest of this talk, I'm also going to ignore environmental variability, because you can sort of, uh, yeah, it's, it's not super interesting for what I'm going to be talking about. So. When a trait evolves, of course, this genetic variance um, changes through time. And you can show pretty easily that under a reasonable, sort of wide range of reasonable models, at equilibrium, the genetic variation is given by twice the population size times the mutational input. And what is meant by the mutational input is uh, how many mutations you get per individual per generation. So you get, if you have a mutation rate of mu, and um, each person is a diploid, so you have two chromosomes. You get two mu mutations per individual per generation. And each mutation, you imagine, draws its effect from a distribution with variance sigma squared. So that's how you get this equilibrium variance. But of course, this is, again, the expected variance at equilibrium. Um, and Lynch and Hill in 86 calculated the variance of the variance at equilibrium. Motivated in some in part by this uh, equilibrium variance result, Landy has this very influential model of quantitative trait evolution as a Brownian motion. And in this case, this is obviously an approximation of the full model in that we're not keeping track of individual loci, and we're critically assuming genetic variance is constant in time. And sort of along with that, we're assuming that mutations have sort of very small effects. We're in this infinitesimal model where you have many mutations of very small effects, seems pretty reasonable that this gives you a Brownian motion kind of thing. And uh, Landy also showed that you can use an ornstein ullenbeck model to model stabilizing selection in this regime. And of course, this has been extremely influential in uh, comparative biology. Uh, Felsenstein, with the independent contrast models, really sort of said that when you're looking at continuous traits in comparative data, you better be having some model of trait evolution in mind, or you're going to make <coughs> the wrong inferences. But while people have been using the Brownian model for a long time, I think that we're starting to see that there's evidence for non-Brownian evolution from comparative data. So this on the left here is a figure from a paper by uh, Uyeda and colleagues from a couple years ago, where they basically, on the x-axis, is uh, 
time between two species, like the, the phylogenetic distance between two species, and on the y-axis is the phenotypic difference between these species, and they basically argued, well, look, what you have is like almost no change for about a million years, and then suddenly an explosion of change. Uh, after that, they call this a blunderbuss pattern because it looks kind of like a blunderbuss, I guess. But um, they said that, well, what's really going on is you're waiting for macroevolutionary changes to happen, and then suddenly there's a big burst of change sort of in a jump-like fashion. Um, Along those same lines, this is a figure from a paper by Mike Landis and myself and Mason Liang, where we, were, we developed some models of continuous trade evolution, uh, inference strategies for these models that you can apply to comparative data. And what basically you can think of this x-axis is a parameter that specifies non-Gaussianity. The y, then this is a posterior density of that parameter. Um, the solid line is the posterior density as inferred from uh, primate data set, and the dashed line is sort of a bootstrap uh, posterior density where we simulated data assuming that there was no, uh, no large effect mutation. So as you can see, there's pretty strong support here for non-Gaussianity uh, non where the Gaussian guy would have a mode at two. So we thought about this, and of course both Uyeda and ourselves invoked some sort of selective um, the explanation for these non-Gaussianities, but we thought, well, maybe let's go back to a neutral model and see if we can invoke some of this stuff from a neutral model. Um, and so the model that I'm going to talk about is uh, haploid instead of diploid because it makes all the calculations much easier, as always. Uh, we're going to have a trait governed by n loci. Each locus is independent, so we're assuming that there is no, uh, there's free recombination between loci that impact the trait. And uh, we have a constant mutation rate. And also, every locus draws its effect from an effect size distribution with density uh, p of y. So this is, sort of, this is just an example of the model. So here's a two locus model. We have a sample of size 5 from the population. We just, without loss of generality, say the root is 0. Uh, the root phenotype of each locus is 0. And then here you have a mutation that draws an effect that makes you point to whatever units bigger in your quantitative trait. So you trace that down, you can see that all of these three individuals have phenotype that's point two. This individual, these two individuals got an ancestral mutation that made it point three, or minus point three. And so they're minus point three. You do the same thing at this other one, and then to get the ultimate phenotype of each individual, you add across loci, right? So point two plus zero is point two and so on and so forth. So that's the model. If there's any questions, this would probably be a good time to clarify. Yeah? How do you set the scale for your traits? Uh, in what sense? Yeah, I mean, so um, you normalize. Um, yeah, so the scale you know? will, yeah. I think I might answer the okay. question. So. so, well, I guess to say, so the, the, the mutations are drawn from some effect distribution. And I'm going to need that to behave nicely to calculate things. Maybe that will, and you'll see that, yeah. Sorry, I was probably spacing out and you already said this, but the assumption here is independent loci and no selection. Yeah, no selection. We wanted to try to get some non-Gaussianity in a neutral model. And, and, and a lot of such loci that add together. Yeah, in, in the end I'm going to be talking about a lot of such loci. So, as was just brought up, there's this question of what are mutational effects like? So. The common model is this infinitesimal model. So this is a, a figure that I uh, asked if someone could point it to me on Twitter, and Twitter helped, so that was very nice. Um, what this is basically showing is some human height GWAS, genome-wide association study results, and basically showing that as you increase the number of plus alleles that an individual has, you also increase their height. And the increases are basically small. That's sort of the take home from this figure. In real data, the increases in height per plus allele are very small. This is a figure from another paper where they tried to estimate the distribution of uh, effects from various GWAS hits. And basically, again, what you can see is that the vast majority of, of GWAS hits, or excuse me, not even GWAS hits, but this is sort of supposed to be the inferred distribution of effects across all causative loci are very small. So, and quickly tail out. Um, so that's sort of the, the traditional model that you get. But 
There are some cases where you might expect there to be large effect mutations. So this is a figure from a paper out of Tricia Wickkopf's group, where what they did is they basically um, labeled a yeast protein with yellow fluorescent protein, um, made a shitload of mutations, and uh, asked how much does the expression level change. So the expression level of this gene, the amount of yellow fluorescence that it produced, was the phenotype. And for various classes of mutations, you can see that they actually got some very large effect mutations. For example, some that reduced normalized expression by a minus 38, whatever units these are. So you can see that in these cases, it's pretty reasonable to think you might get um, large effect mutations, for example, by disrupting a transcription factor binding site, or for example, getting a null mutation in an upstream pathway where you sort of knock out everything downstream and hence no longer express the gene. To do some calculations in this case, um, since I'm doing a lot of stuff with sums of random variables, it's not going to be very useful to work in the phenotype space. So instead, I'm going to work using characteristic functions. And just to remind you what a characteristic function is, it's the expectation of this thing where i is the imaginary unit, uh, square root of minus 1. And you, so right, you just compute this expectation. And the reason this is helpful is because if I have a random variable that's a sum, of a bunch of independent random variables, as I basically do here, then I can just compute the characteristic function of that sum by multiplying across um, my random variables. And if you were, uh, if you noticed when I described my mutational model, you basically have given the coalescent tree, the mutational process is a compound Poisson process along the tree. What I mean by that is, you have nt hits of a rate lambda Poisson process, and then your trait at the end of it is just the sum of random, uh, random increments of nt random increments, right? So this is a compound Poisson process. You wait, you jump, you wait, you jump, you wait, you jump. And it's easy to show that the characteristic function of a compound Poisson process is this thing, where here, so this is the characteristic function of the compound Poisson process, and this psi is the characteristic function of the jump kernel. So sort of is the characteristic function of the yi's in this case. Okay. So let's try to do some calculations in this case. Um, the simplest one is for a sample of size 2. And I apologize for my MS Paint figures. Um, what you have here is uh, if you condition on this sample on the, the coalescence time of these two individuals, it's easy to calculate this because you sort of have a compound Poisson process going this way, a compound Poisson process going this way. And what I'll explain a bit more thoroughly later is that it's actually going to be better to compute the difference in phenotype of these two rather than sort of the joint density of x1 and x2 because that's going to end up depending on the root and that's sort of not something we want to really care about. So how do you do this, right? You calculate the characteristic function conditioned on the, the uh, coalescence time, which has this density e minus t, standard coalescent theory. Crank through some stuff, and you get some, some calculation, right? And what's kind of cool about this is this is basically general for any mutation effect distribution at one locus, because I've assumed essentially nothing besides that the characteristic function exists, which it always does if, this is, if the mutation effect kernel is a probability. Um, measure. So yeah, like I said, there's this issue with the phenotype at the root. And basically, it's easy to see in pictures, if you didn't think about it already, which is that if I'm starting with this sample of size 4, and now I say, well, I want to make a sample of size 5, I should be able to do that in a sort of consistent way. And I obviously can in this case, but it might be the case that my fifth sample ends up coalescing more anciently than the root, in which case, the root is no longer 0, which I tried to do to make compu computations easy. It's actually some other number x that you might need to, that you need to figure out how to consistently set. So there's going to be a distribution on this trait value that will give you 0 here. This seemed too, too complicated. I don't want to deal with that. So instead, I just normalized out the root by saying if I have n expression level, or excuse me, n, n individuals in my population, x0 to xn minus 1, I can just um, reduce my sample size by 1. And instead of considering x0 to xn minus 1, I'll consider these z's, which are defined as the difference of each individual with x0. So now, 
since all of these differences basically pass through the root. So now if I'm looking at these two, I have to go all the way up to the root and I basically subtract out the root so I don't need to worry about it anymore. And using this approach with a little bit, uh, you can do the same characteristic function calculation. It becomes a lot more tedious for a sample of size three. Uh, and you have something, and here I've assumed that the mutation kernel is symmetric. Um, and that's what I'm going to assume for the rest of this. So okay, this sucks. Like doing these calculations sucks. I don't want to keep doing it. Can I do something, do something that makes this a little bit easier? So I'm going to take this limit of the number of loci getting large. And of course, you can do this in sort of dumb ways and get either uh, sort of a uniform distribution on R as your traits, which is obviously not what you want. Or you can do it in some other ways and get sort of point masses, which is, again, not really interesting. And in order to do this, we need to decrease the effect size of each locus or the mutation rate at each locus in such a way that we get something non-trivial in the limit. And I'm going to tell you about three non-trivial limits. Um, two of which are very similar, and one of which I will ignore. But uh, this one, this first one is when the mutation rate per locus decreases. Then the next two are when the effect size per locus decreases, so moving into the infinitesimal range. But the difference here being um, whether or not there are mutations of large effect. So if you take this decreasing mutation rate um, approach, where basically what you have is that the product of the number of loci and the mutation rate per locus stays constant, you end up getting, you can take this limit in the sample of size 3 and get what looks to me to be the sort of the, the characteristic function of, a correl of two correlated compound Poisson processes. Not totally sure how else to interpret that. Um, but I don't think I'm, but I'm not going to talk about this much more because I don't think this is really biologically relevant. I think really what we think is not that as you get more and more loci, you get more uh, mutations become rare and rarer. So I'm going to ignore this one and instead focus more on the classical sort of infinitesimal model. So if you fail to have large effect mutations, if your uh, mutational kernel does not have fat tails or is not power law, then you get, unsurprisingly, a, a Gaussian limit. So you take, you, you get this compound parameter that is the uh, product of the number of loci and the variance per locus. Your characteristic function for the sample size converges to this thing, which can be recognized as a bivariate Gaussian distribution with this variance covariance matrix. So uh, this seems nice. If you have, in Instead, fat tails, so your density has tails that look like this for alpha less than 2. This is the sort of standard power law. Uh, you know, this is what it means to, to have a power law. Uh, you redefine some parameters and you take your limit again. You get something here that is the characteristic function of a bivariate alpha stable distribution. Now, the problem is, unlike Gaussian distributions, where there's sort of one thing that is a multivariate Gaussian distribution, so you always are just specified by a variance-covariance matrix. There's sort of a lot of things that are multivariate stable distributions. Um, and this will come back to bite me in a little bit. So a nice thing here is that, as we know, the, the lineages from a coalescent are exchangeable. And what we know about exchangeable things is DiFinetti's theorem, which says that if I have an infinitely exchangeable random vector, then I can compute the probability density of a subsample of that random vector as a mixture over IID probability densities. That is, this here, this product in here, is just the probability of x1 to xn given some random given a probability measure, and then I need to integrate over these probability measures. So that's what DiFinetti's theorem tells us, and it says, well, since my coalescent limits are my coalescent lineages are exchangeable can I use DiFinetti's theorem to do something interesting? And in the normal case, you, you can. And it's sort of a more general result that a, uh, about multivariate normal distributions with, with like very nicely behaved variance-covariance matrices. But basically, the guess is that the, given the mean value of the trait, the trait is distributed as a normal distribution with, sorry, that should be mean m, and variance theta over 2 sigma squared. 
And then the mean itself is random with variance with, uh, as a, normal a normally distributed random variable with mean zero and the same variance. So if you compute the, random, the variance of x using the law of total variance, you get the same equilibrium variance as you computed. As I showed you earlier, that's computed using sort of uh, recursion approaches. And this is sort of a proof that this ends up working. So that leads to a tempting interpretation and a conjecture, which is that if you condition on the amount of evolution exclusive to the sample that you're normalizing to, that's basically the mean, right? Everyone has to be subtracted from the amount of evolution on, along this lineage that you've normalized against. And then you basically integrate, and then basically in, in the limit here, every sample or excuse me, each sample is the first sample that coalesces with that sample at some point. So you basically integrate over the coalescence time of your given sample and that one that you're normalizing against. So this interpretation seems to say that you can get a very nice thing instead of having to worry about multivariate Gaussians. You have this quite simple mixture story where the limit distribution is normal with variance theta over two sigma squared and a random mean. And this is you know, nice if you want to apply this to some data. So we tested this. We, we could not figure out how to prove this if for general sample sizes, but we tested this by doing simulations. So we simulated the coalescent model I described. <laughs> what you're seeing here along the x-axis is the number of loci. Along the y-axis is the number of samples. And this is a heat map of the kolmogorov smirnov uh, d-test. So basically, when it's this color, that means that the D is very small. These look like the same distribution. When it's this color, they look different. And you can see that as the number of loci increases, you actually do end up converging, sort of. You get, you converge to the limiting distribution, at least in simulations. So we thought, great, this worked for the normal case. Does this work in the case where you have power law mutations? And so we made basically, this is essentially the, the mirror conjecture in the power law case. And we tried to do the same simulations. And you can see it's not as impressive as before in some sense. So whereas before, we got basically all the way down into the, the zero. There was no difference when we have a large number of samples and a large number of loci. Here, it's not seeming to converge that fast. And we thought, well, is this just telling us that the convergence is slower? Or is it telling us that the conjecture is wrong? So we simulated, we, we, we had simulated data to do this, and we just looked at the simulated data. And what I'm showing here is something like 10 um, density estimates of the quantitative trait from the, the simulations. The black line, which you can barely see, is what you would predict from the conjecture. And the other lines are random sample, are random um, instances of the the simulations. And what you can see is basically none of them look like what you predict from the conjecture, right? There's sort of more randomness than expected. You get some things that are somehow uh, wider, some things that are somehow skinnier. So it seems like in the, the alpha stable case, in the case where you have power laws, this conjecture doesn't hold. So for a long time, we thought, well, we must be doing our simulations wrong. So I, I sucked it up and did a horrible calculation for a sample of size 4, where there's 18 trees. And it's not a very pleasant thing to calculate. But in the end, basically, for the conjecture to hold, this is what we would need the, the characteristic function in this limit to look like. Because you sort of, this, this part comes from the random mean, or random median. And this part comes from the independence. But actually, the characteristic function looks like this. So we have this part and this part. But we also get this sort of, extra sort of extra correlation where you have pairwise correlations. Correlation is not quite the right word um, since it doesn't exist. But uh, these pairwise dependencies that couldn't be there for this conjecture to hold. So that's led us to a very weak conjecture, which is that the uh, limit distribution is alpha stable with some random parameters. We don't know what they are. And I'm not honestly even sure that this is right. I think there might be the fact that you get this sort of pairwise thing, and probably as you go to larger sample sizes, you get sort of three wise, four wise, five wise. Makes me think that actually it might be a mixture of uh, 
distri stable distributions, and I cannot get anywhere with this. So if someone has any thoughts, that would be awesome to hear. But taking this conjecture, we decided, OK, let's see what we can find in empirical data. So we looked at um, RNA-seq data, so gene expression data from a fungus called Neurospora crassa. It comes from this pretty sweet paper by Chris Ellison, who's a postdoc with Doris Backtrog uh, from a couple years ago. And we restricted to our genes with uh, FPKM greater than 1. If you're not sort of familiar with gene expression stuff, this basically means we restricted to genes whose expression levels look like they're more than noise. And what we did is for each gene, we fit a normal distribution and an alpha-stable distribution. And then we asked, uh, we performed a likelihood ratio test. So the normal distribution is an alpha-stable distribution with alpha equals 2. So we tested this null hypothesis that alpha equals 2 versus the hypothesis that alpha is less than 2. And that's what we thought we did, basically. Actually, we didn't do it right. And I didn't have time before this to uh, fix that up. But we did have some analysis for a few genes. I think that this is probably not, these results are not final, but they're relatively close to what you would expect when we don't have typos in our code. So the distribution of p-values is the first thing I want to show you. So this is one of those cases where you don't expect your p-values to be chi-square distributed, I'm sorry, not your p-values, but your likelihood ratio statistic should not be chi-square distributed because you have uh, your null hypothesis is on the boundary of your parameter space. So you get a lot of p-values that are basically the, the um, inferred parameter was on the boundary of the parameter space. So that's what's going on here. But you can see that we have sort of an excess also of low, low, um, low p-values, suggesting that there might be something interesting. And in fact, 54 of our 300-ish genes are significant with an FDR of 32%. So maybe you know, 30 of these genes are actually real. When you look at the, the alpha, so the sort of the heaviness of the tails in each of these genes, this is the histogram you get, you can see that things are basically between about 1.4 and 1.8. Um, so they're not like super duper heavy tailed. None of these have infinite mean, but of course they all have infinite variance as Oscar mentioned the other day. And then I, to convince you we did something interesting, I cherry picked some examples. Um, so each of these is a different gene. The histogram is the observed uh, distribution of gene expression levels. In red is the best fitting Gaussian. In black is the best fitting stable distribution. And I don't have anything really to say about this besides it doesn't look so bad to me. Um, and so that's really it. Uh, I think I sort of powered through that. So. What we were able to do is introduce this coalescent model of quantitative trait evolution. This, has, this sort of same idea has been used um, a couple times in the past, but it's actually somewhat rare, despite how it seems to be a pretty powerful way to compute things. And uh, it's you know, tedious but straightforward to calculate these characteristic functions for arbitrary sample sizes. And to try to make it simpler on us, we found these limiting distributions as the number of loci became large. And we conjectured about how these limiting distributions extend to larger samples, making use of DiFinetti's theorem. Um, simple things to include, what makes this model sort of powerful is it's very easy to include, say, samples that are non-contemporaneous by using the uh, serially sampled coalescent. It's easy, again, to include population structure. Doing all of these things does not really make your job any harder. Um, extending it to diploid seems kind of tedious, but again, straightforward, because you just have to calculate for larger and larger trees. Every individual you add adds two more individuals or two more lineages in your coalescent. And so it's not super fun. But so the, one of the criticisms that's often levied here is that basically no quantitative traits evolve neutrally. Um, but I think that there's a couple reasons to, for, to study this. I mean, obviously, it gives you some analytically tractable calculations, which is always fun. But I think it does give you intuition for what to expect with weak selection. For example, you don't expect, if you do have these um, power law mutation kernels, you expect to probably be able to see that with weak selection. And if there's something we can learn about that from this model, even when we're applying it to real data, for example, this gene expression data that's almost certainly under weak selection, 
uh, that might be a good thing. And of course, it's a null model. You need to, when you're saying that some quantitative trait has evolved under selection, it's usually a good idea to know what you mean by saying a quantitative trait hasn't evolved under selection. So, thanks. So, a lot of time for questions? Yeah. Oh, okay. Can you just give a quick intuition for what exactly is going wrong in the uh, heavy tail case and sample size, you know, bigger sample sizes? Is there some rare large event that is being shared by these two individuals? Yeah, I think that's basically what's going wrong is that sort of even in the limit you get such large mutations in each locus that you, um, that you get some extra correlation structure, basically, exactly what you said. Can you put up the trivariate? Um, yeah. This guy. Right. So this guy is, it's a, it's a stable guy, right? Yeah. So, um, so this guy, have you sort of come across the stuff about Lepage representations? I don't think so. So basically, if you've got um, sort of any stable, um, you could write it as a, uh, an infinite series of um, IID random variables with weights that are um, sort of what is it a gamma gammas to the minus alpha you know gamma random mm -hmm. variables to the minus alpha and so you know those IID random variables sort of tell you mm -hmm. kind of what the story is and so translating and it's sort of similar also into this that you can, you know, write this characteristic function in terms of a distribution on the, right. the unit sphere, right? right? And so either of those things sort of give you a feeling for sort of what's going on, right? Right, you know, yeah. Just that's the, that's the, is that something yeah. will at least give us a feeling of yeah. what's going on. But, you know, trying yeah. those things that's a to, idea. to, to yeah, sort of see if you... Not to disagree with my cohort. <laughs> but there's also a plus on representation for these things that show you the stable all comes from mostly a few large values, right? And when the large values are shared between the lineage, right. well, that's what the, the, well, that's what the Lepage representation does. Right? Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, it's a rewriting of the, of the um, Lady Ingenito Poisson story. Where you sort of group things in such a way that, you know, uh, and so it, it really gives you a sense of, um, you know, you're stable. You know, it's sort of just like with the Gaussian, sort of that you, it's doing something similar to giving you the um, ellipsoid associated with the variance covariance matrix. So it's sort of telling you, you know, most of the actions happening in this direction. And, we should probably talk to the speaker later. Could you go back to in the beginning this, this blunderbuss guy? Yeah. Um, I, I was kind of confused about what, what you were claiming there. So, so you, you described it, I mean, this is on a log scale. So you're saying, you know, you go back a million years and there's not much, and then suddenly in the next nine million years, yeah. <laughs> what they're claiming is basically, and I don't fully agree with their interpretation of it, but what they're claiming is that you basically wait, it's sort of a stasis followed by rapid evolution models. So, like, no, I mean, what, do you, what are we actually looking at here? Oh, what, uh, a trumpet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so this this axis is the the divergence in these log in log, log scale divergence, yeah. and this axis is time, right, between two contempt. So I think this is from fossil taxa. So that time means it's like size, size, overall size. Yeah, I forget exactly what this is. <laughs> Yeah, I, t I chose one of the like five of these figures from their paper, so I don't remember which which phenotype it is. But I mean, they basically say, okay, well, we have these pair of fossils that are ten to the four years apart. Their body size is also is this much difference. Plot that, and then so on and so forth. But is there, if you had 
there's, but it's not as though there's some comparison curve that you could put on there that you would unambiguously expect with the Brannian story. Right, yeah, I agree. And, and if you were to, again, if you were to plot this on a linear scale, it would just look like you know, both gradual. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I don't, I, I actually, I mean, so what they did was they tried to fit, uh, you know, Brian motion kind of thing to this, and then they also fit sort of a one hit compound Poisson process to this, so sort of conditioned to go off only once. And so they said the likelihood dash, fit the, the, the Poisson better. So what is the dash one? I think it's the uh, variance, expected variance under that best fit model. So what they really, they really like, it's sort of stasis, with some white noise and then one hit of a Poisson process that sends you going to fly. Yeah. So when you showed us the, your calculation of the characteristic, characteristic function, yeah. uh, it means that you, you have integrated over the, uh, the uh, prior distribution of the tree? Yeah. yeah. And, and so, so the, the, the tree you've chosen is the, the key one Yeah. yeah. So, so are you, are no, you haven't integrated over the prior. You've taken I mean, infinitely I've, many copies of the, the prior, right? But for each one, I've integrated over it. Yeah. That's sort of this, let's see if it's I can a, find it. It's a tree-free it. result, right? Yeah, this, that's what's going on here in the sample of size 2. Is I'm first conditioning on the tree, and then I'm integrating over it. Because I don't know anything about the tree. So what, what, what confidence do you have in the, uh, the fact that you take human currency for, let's say, like, like large claims. Yeah, so I'm actually imagining this being within a population rather than between yeah. species. So I am sort of thinking that the human coalescent is right. <coughs> Sorry, but in, yeah. can I just say, in this one you've integrated over the tree, yeah. but in the trivariate one. Yeah, I also integrated over the tree. But what you do is you take samples of the tree, then run your stable thing on that, mm -hmm. and then add all of those guys up, right? Right. That's how I simulate. Yeah, so you're getting, so from that, you, you, you're having a, just adding up lots of um, mixtures of stables. Right. But ending up with something that's stable in the end, right? That's kind of a cool thing. Wait, are you adding them up or are you well, looking at the empirical distribution? No, it's, you're adding them up, aren't you? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm absolutely adding across yeah. the trees. Because your quantitative trait is the sum of all these contributions from each you locus. Think, like you said, it's a coalescent within a species yeah. within a population. Yeah. So it's not yeah. like all oh, the locus I share the same ancestry or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You have a different coalescent for each locus, yeah. an independent coalescent oh, for each okay. locus. Right. So that's the cool thing. You're adding up all these sum these mixtures of stables, of multivariate stables and getting a, a multivariate stable in the end. Or not. <laughs> well, no, that, 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 that trivariate guy is a stable. It is a stable. Well, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think we have three more questions here. Yeah. Um, Sorry. Um, so, one application of your stable work is in the contrast between genome wide association study searches and the uh, genome wide complex trait uh, modeling. Mm -hmm. uh, could you and the GCTA approach that's usually implemented starts off with that Gaussian distribution. That's right. Critical to it. If you change that to a stable distribution, you presumably get quite different answers. Uh, could you say a few words about how you see the implications of this contrast for practical? Well, practical complex trait analysis. Yeah, I've sort of thought about that peripherally, but I, I, I do think that the, the data points to some things like height really being pretty Gaussian, both the distribution in populations is pretty Gaussian, and when you do GWAS, you do get these Gaussian things. I think the place, I really think um, gene expression is really one of the key places where you might see this kind of stable law because of things like uh, knocking out transcription factor binding sites, for example. And I think that you, you'll still get a signal of that when people do like a GWAS for uh, 
EQTLs, expression QTLs, because you will pick up, for example, like you often pick up like that there's tons of cis, like very local regulatory variation that is very large effect compared to any of the, the transacting variation that you can find. And part of that is a power issue because you're doing much fewer tests when you're looking in cis. But I do think that that, I think we'll get hints of it if this is really going on in, say, human traits or in traits where we're really powered to do GWAS, we'll, we'll start to see hints of like, well, if I just plot the empirical distribution of effect sizes that I see, even though I've made, I've inferred this under a Gaussian assumption, I'll start to see that maybe there's too much large-tailed stuff that, than I would have expected. Like, even though I'm doing sort of, you know, thinking about it in a sort of an empirical Bayes kind of way, you're going to see that your empirical Bayes assumption didn't really fit in the end. Yeah. You made just two quick questions yeah. and answers, maybe, please. I had, I think Graham had one, and, 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 and over there, right there. Yeah. Well, partly related to that, so you, one of the assumptions I understood is now is that weak selection is in relation to generation time, so you need to have strong selection in respect to generation time for it. For something that, like yeast, the uh, protein, we know that the generation time of the protein is partly longer than the, the division time of, of the yeast. Um, there I can easily see, but related to Ken's question in terms of the application of some other critters with quantitative traits, um, there I think I, I agree with you, it would be very intriguing to see if it really fits. When it comes down to GWAS or gene expression data, I'm always skeptical because like our our detection and our screening on small effects is so limited basically by the methods that we, we will lose a lot on it and it might easily look like that you don't find the small effects and it looks not at all Gaussian because of the methods and rather not because of the data right. and like that. And that was, there was this figure I showed. Uh, the inferred, this, whoops, okay, well, there we go, this thing, and what this paper was about was taking that inferred effect distribution, which is obviously going to be biased toward large effects, and back inferring what the small effects sort of things look like, so yeah, I mean, and I do think that this is probably reasonable for things like human eye. So one thing about the uh, gene expression data is that most of the mutational import is in a particular place, which is the cis region, right. which only potentially has a limited number of genealogies, perhaps one. Right. So presumably, does that complicate how I think about fitting these distributions? I think it does. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've, rec I've realized that too in sort of doing this, and I don't know what exactly it would do. So. You could imagine that sort of the trans effects give you a Gaussian, they sort of fall into the Gaussian thing, and then you add this one additional genealogy that gives you a large effect thing. And so, in principle, it's easy to, to do these calculations and see how much, you know, how much uh, having a whole bunch of large effect mutations matters versus just having really one place. And I don't have an intuition for how much that matters. Okay, then yeah, let's think of speakers again.